Hey, welcome back to the channel. I just wanted to start this episode off with a little bit of an apology. I haven't posted anything for a few weeks because my wife and I, we actually took our camper van out west, went to Yosemite National Park. We also stopped at Rocky Mountain National Park. I uh, might have some content on that in the future. I uh, have quite a bit of video, probably a couple episodes at least, um, that I haven't posted yet that I'm still working on. But yeah, I will continue my somewhat infrequent uploads of content. Stay tuned for that. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the next episode, which I recorded several weeks ago. <laughs> Well, Suka. Morning, ladies. Today we're going to continue on the electrical. I did kind of get a start on the electrical before and then I realized I kind of was getting ahead of myself and I kind of went to a different project, the windmill. I've worked out a big plan of what needs to happen. It takes quite a bit of planning and I'll go into that in a second, but uh, just to let you know what we're working with here, I am going to do a lot of my wiring in this 14 gauge copper stranded wire. It's uh, a zip wire. You can find it on Amazon. So I've got the 14 gauge and then I also picked up a bunch of 10 gauge. Same thing, uh, copper wire. And then I also picked up five strand LED wire because uh, we might get a little fancy. Next I'll show you all the work that went into uh, planning out the system. So the first thing I like doing is coming up with simple drawings to make sure I'm being efficient when I go to wire. For the different components such as the ceiling fan, the LED lights, the manufacturer usually provides a recommended fuse size. But this is where people can get a little tripped up. It's a common misconception that a fuse is protecting the device or the component, and that's simply not true. The fuse is there to protect the wire between the load and the battery. This means that you need to size the fuse according to the resistance of the wire. And before you can do that, you first need to determine the correct gauge wire needed based on the load demands and the length of wire. There's a lot of wire and fuse diagrams on the internet that can help you do this, but I found that calculators are a little bit more accurate and easier to use. One such calculator can be found on a website that I reference a lot, uh, explorist.life. They have a fuse size calculator as well as a wire size calculator. Honestly, their website is full of helpful information when you're building your own camper, so definitely check them out. But once you know the load demand and the length of the wire needed, then you can determine the appropriate gauge for that wire, and then you can determine the appropriate fuse needed. Now, you will likely still be able to use the manufacturer's recommended fuse size for a component or load, but definitely make sure that you cross-reference it with the fuse size calculator. For me, when I was first getting into a lot of this stuff, this was the most daunting, the most intimidating part of building the camper vans and camper conversions. It was the wiring. It's definitely not something that you want to just throw together. I mean, you could do a lot of damage. So, anyway, I'm going to get to it. Well, would you look at that? I am very happy to be on this end of the project. That was kind of tedious stuff. Uh, it's always fun, always a little tricky to figure out how to route wires um, in really small confined spaces in these small wall cavities. But you can kind of see everything's labeled, everything's sorted. The DC, actually the DC and the AC stuff here 
it's all going to be in a box um, that's going to be in a bench on this side of the trailer. So everything, including the batteries, the inverter, charger, um, the solar controller, everything is going to be in that bench. Uh, but yeah, so eventually when we put the wall panels back up, I will just drill some holes and I'll stick the wires out of those holes and then I'll be able to actually add the components such as the USB chargers, the bed lights, and so on. Over here we're going to have a future cabinet. There will be some under cabinet lighting and then I also ran the five strand LED wiring that will go into that cabinet as well. That way we'll be able to have multiple LED controllers and you'll be able to branch off from those controllers to provide LED lighting throughout the trailer. Over here we have a bathroom junction box and you can see I also ran wire for the AC stuff. I've got an outlet here that's going to be next to the kitchen. Uh, then I got another one down here which is actually for a closet AC unit. We'll talk more about that in the future. But then over here I've got my light switches, one for a future awning, a dual zone dimmer for the main ceiling lights, and then also a switch will be to the right of that for a porch light. So there's the porch light on the right. And then the rest of the wire uh, from the dimmer switch goes obviously up to the ceiling lights. And I did have a couple of them wired just to make sure that the dimmer switch was working. And then as we follow the wires back over to the passenger side, we can see uh, the red wire anyway is for the DC fridge. I did provide some extra wire just in case I decide to move the fridge to a slightly different location in the future. And I do have a sort of junction box over here as well for a future power awning and LED lighting for that awning. And the LED wire runs all the way over to that same future cabinet that I mentioned before. So lots of fun options in the future. So let's go back to the junction box you saw a little while ago. Uh, a couple things to point out here. I initially tried using these gray plastic clamps to secure the wires at the junction box, and I don't know if they were meant for a different box or a different product, but I couldn't get them to hold really well. I was not happy with it. On the right side, you can see a more traditional clamp connector. I ended up replacing the other two with this style connector, and now the wires are much more secure, and I'll sleep good now. <laughs> I should also point out the Wago wire connectors that you see in the junction box. I've been using these for a while now. I think they're awesome. I think they're great for stranded wire. I think they're better than a wire nut, honestly. If you talk to some residential electricians, some are adopting these, some are not. Some would rather stick with the traditional wire nut. For household electrical, when you're dealing with mostly solid wire, it's maybe a different conversation. But I'd like to make the distinction that I think the Wago is the better product when dealing with stranded wire. Now I say this because if you've ever tried twisting together two stranded wires and then joining them with a wire nut, as soon as you start turning that wire nut, you notice that the wires in your other hand, they just start looping around each other. You're not getting a great bite inside that wire nut like you would with solid wire. That being said, uh, for a house, you know, sometimes you're dealing with stranded wire with light fixtures, things of that nature. It's probably going to be fine. Uh, it's not moving, ideally. <laughs> But when you're dealing with an RV, camper vans, something that's going to be traveling down the road for many miles and is going to be subject to a lot of vibration, I don't think it's going to take that much uh, to get that wire nut to spin, even a little bit. So anyway, here you can see me really pulling on this wire, trying to get it to come out of this Wago connector. Uh, it's not budging. It's a great connection. I even try to spin it because sometimes people claim that you can spin it and it'll come out. I think that's more an issue with the solid wire. So next I'm moving to the traditional wire nut and I'm trying to use the same force that I used on the Wago and I know I'm pulling on it really hard but it's still showcasing that it's the inferior product between the two. Anyway, enough about that for now. I doubt I'm changing anyone's mind about Wagos, but I just feel like I have to share my experiences and my thoughts about the products that I'm showcasing in my videos. It is worth noting that these Wagos do come in different sizes. You have to make sure you match the wire gauge to the correct Wago or else they will not work. Um, they come in two wire, three wire, maybe even up to six wire. And they also offer a uh, a lever clamp version which is awesome if you want to replace something down the road otherwise you end up just cutting off the connector and replacing it and there are other brands that offer similar connectors as well but these are the only ones that I can find locally and the ones that I've used but yeah they work great definitely check them out and then as far as securing the wires to the wall I used a couple different products here I liked these cable tie mounts you screw them to the wall and then the cable tie will go through the mount and around the wires and then I also like using these insulated clamps uh, they are rubber lined uh, they really hold on to the wires well and they won't do any damage 
and they come in a lot of different sizes so they're super handy so i just wanted to come inside to talk about this next bit because it's getting really cold outside i just thought i'd mention a trend that i've seen i i do see a few builds where people want to run wire through conduit which requires drilling a hole through your floor assuming you're running the conduit under the trailer you have to run that conduit to a connector and then to the junction box and depending on how big your trailer is and how far you're running your wires you might have multiple runs of conduit you might have multiple junction boxes and to me you're adding complexity to an already pretty complex scenario um, it might help in terms of shorter wire runs but in my opinion it just wasn't worth it uh, my trailer is small enough my wire runs were it wasn't it wasn't that bad and I've tried running wire through conduit before. I've tried it with band builds. If you've ever tried running wire through a piece of conduit that already has other wires in it, it's not an easy thing to do at all. If you think you're saving yourself hassle in the future, if you want to add something down the road, that's why I think a lot of people want to do it is they want to be able to run wire through that conduit and add something down the road like a fan or a light. It's not going to be easy to run wire through the conduit. I think it's just as easy to run wire in the wall and maybe provide a junction box. You can run a wire to that junction box or you can run a oversized wire to something else and then you can branch off of that down the road. So I just think it's easier to skip the whole conduit thing. Uh, but somebody prove me wrong. Somebody tell me if they've done this and and it's worked out well for them, let me know. All right, so here I'm installing a third outlet on the exterior of my trailer. This is a GFCI outlet. It has a weatherproof cover that I'm installing and it's gonna be on its own dedicated breaker so that I can easily turn it on or off. It actually didn't take long before it rained, so it gave me an opportunity to make sure everything was staying dry, everything was sealed up nice and tight with this outlet. So next I'm installing two porch lights uh, these lights are by a company called Leisure LED. I went with these because I wanted a motion sensing porch light. I quickly discovered when searching for porch lights that the industry standard is just a simple on off light. Um, if you do find a light that is motion sensing, they're often ridiculously expensive, like $100 or more for a single light. And that's just silly because motion sensing technology isn't new. It's not expensive. So this light, for instance, is only $20. The light comes with two lenses. You can easily swap them out. You get one amber lens and one clear lens. It's IP65 waterproof rated. It has a draw of 2.7 watts and it's 280 lumens bright. So I'm sure the more expensive lights on the market, they're probably made out of metal. They might be a little bit brighter. They're probably more durable. But for my use for the average camper, I think this is gonna be a nice upgrade to the standard simple porch light. So this is actually the second light that I'm installing. The first one is next to the man door on the other side, but it's gonna be nice to have two lights, one on each side. This one's gonna be next to the outdoor kitchen area, and it's just gonna provide a little extra security all around the trailer. Uh, pretty straightforward though, drill a hole, connect the wires, don't forget your grommet, and screw it down. So after it rained, um, it got me thinking, what's stopping the rain from getting behind the light and maybe getting the wire connections wet, or maybe even eventually getting inside the trailer. It might be a very small amount of water, it might take a long time, it might be unlikely, but I like the idea of no water getting in. <laughs> so I discovered that the light on the backside, it actually has a channel that goes all the way around it, almost as if it was meant to have a seal, but it didn't come with one. So I applied a little bit of RTV, uh, put it back against the trailer. I didn't snug it down. I allowed it to cure a little bit as you do with RTV. And once it cured fully, then I snugged it down and I'm confident now that I have a watertight seal behind the light. So one of the last electrical components left to be installed is a small bathroom fan. I'll be installing the Max Air six inch dome fan. I realized early on when designing my camper that I could replace the factory vent with a fan. The fan will provide a lot more airflow, but can also be closed tight when not needed. So one thing to point out here is I had to be very careful with the positioning of the fan because I wanted to make sure that when the fan was installed that it would cover all of the pre-existing screw holes from the factory vent. This fan is pretty cool in that you can mount it horizontally or vertically. So obviously in my case, I'm mounting it on the wall. I just have to make sure that I use the included rain guard to ensure that I can use the fan even when it's raining and not have any leaks. But before we can put the rain guard on, we have to first 
apply the butyl tape, then the fan, then use self-tapping screws to secure it to the trailer, and then seal over that with 3M Fast Cure Marine Sealant. Uh, going over the screws, around the perimeter, I did go a little heavy around the perimeter just because I knew that the rain guard was going to go directly on top of that. So once the rain guard is placed, then you secure it again with self-tapping screws and again add sealant on top of the screws. It's just multiple layers of defense, hopefully ensuring that I have a watertight seal for years to come. And last but not least, the final electrical component that's going through the exterior of the trailer anyway is my 15 amp shore power inlet. Now I'm getting away with a 15 amp service because I'm not running a big rooftop air conditioner. Generally that's the biggest draw that a camper and RV is going to have. I'm going to be using a standard household air conditioner. That's the biggest draw I'm going to have. So I'm going to get away with 15 amp service. Um, I also like it because I'll be able to use just a standard outlet, a standard extension cord. So once I decided on the best placement for the power inlet, I drilled a small hole from the inside, then I went outside and drilled an even bigger hole, then I was able to drop in the power inlet. So that's going to do it with the shore power inlet installed. That should be the very last intrusion that I have to deal with. This project has been a lot more tedious than I expected. You know, having done a few van builds, I thought it would go a little bit quicker than it has. And honestly, I think it's because the vans have been smaller. And with every project I do, they get a little bit bigger, they get a little bit more complicated. So every time I think, oh, I'm going to be better about managing my time and estimating how long it's going to take, well, I'm so far off. I mean, a number of things have come up that have pushed it back that are out of my control. But anyway, it's getting good. And I think it's really going to start coming together. If you know anyone that's in the market for this trailer, that's been the goal from day one uh, with this build. And I didn't reveal that at first, but I'm getting to a point where once the wall panels are up and installed, then it's kind of a clean slate. It's pre-wired. Most of the difficult things are taken care of. So it's going to be at the point where whoever buys this, they can finish it themselves. They can add the cabinets, any walls, everything themselves, or they could hire me to finish it the rest of the way. Either way, I'm super excited for whoever gets this thing. I'm starting to see my vision come to fruition, and I just think this thing is going to be so much fun. Anyway, that should do it for this episode. Lots more coming up, so stick around. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you later.